Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to our financial aid night here at Bedford High School. I see a lot of familiar faces that were here with us uh, just a few weeks ago talking about college planning. So thanks for coming back. I know this is a this is a tough tough topic. Um, you know, furthering our education for our children is, is an expensive endeavor, but we're hoping to give you all the information you need to get started um, and help you make some informed decisions. We are very lucky to have Cameron Owen here from the New Hampshire Higher Education Assistance Foundation, and he is going to give you all of the necessary information, and then I'll close things up um, towards the end and talk to you a little bit more Bedford-specific um, for some local scholarship information. I do want to let you know um, that uh, BCTV is here tonight, um, and are actually recording all of our evening programming now um, that we offer so that parents who can't make it will have an opportunity to watch it on BCTV. Um, I just found out as I came in tonight that we are live. So I just wanted you to be aware of that as you're asking questions um, that it, this is being recorded. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Cameron. Thank you very much. I was just telling Lisa, it's like the movie theater, like no one ever wants to sit up front. So um, like she said, my name is Cameron. I'm one of the college counselors in the Center for College Planning. Um, just by a show of hands, how many of you is this your first child to go off to school? Nice. Uh, how, are you, how many of you are nervous about this whole process? A little overwhelmed? Yeah. Well, I can't promise that I can change those feelings tonight, but what I can try to do is hopefully you guys will leave here learning something that you didn't know uh, as you walked in. So um, a little bit about who we are. Um, we are a free resource for uh, you and your students in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, we work primarily with uh, juniors and seniors going through the college application process and why we're here tonight, the financial aid process. Um, we are fully aware that this is a very overwhelming topic. It be, can, can be kind of confusing. Uh, uh, the goal of tonight is to hopefully make you understand why are you doing this process? Um, why, are, why do the schools need this information? So um, just to cover a couple things that you guys grabbed on the way in here, uh, the booklets that you have, the financial aid insiders, feel free to flip through those throughout the entire presentation. Most of the stuff you're going to see up here, you're going to find in your booklet as well. Uh, there's a couple note pages on the in the back of the book, so feel free to do that. Uh, there are some pens as you guys walked in, so if you do need them, feel free to grab those. One of the other sheets you grabbed, you're going to see a list of schools. Uh, there's about 400 of them on there. These are all schools that require the CSS profile. You may or may not have heard of it before. Um, if you find any schools on that list that your student plans on applying to, you want to make a note of that. Uh, circle that school, highlight it. We will come back to that later on in the presentation, um, and we'll talk about what that form is. And then finally, the other sheet that you grabbed, um, one of the services that we offer for you guys is that if you need assistance in filing for financial aid, that is something you can do with us in our Concord office. Um, so all the appointment days of the week and as well as the times are going to be on there. The number that you guys see on the screen, also on your handouts, that's the number you'd call to make an appointment with us. Um, we are heavy into FAFSA filing season already. Um, it became available on Tuesday. So if that is something that you are looking for help with, please contact us. We'd be happy to help you. Um, as uh, Lisa said, we are uh, recording live, but we also have this stuff online as well. So if you want to have this at home, you can go to neef.org slash handouts and download PDF copies, not only of this presentation, but every other presentation that we do as well. For seniors that are still kind of up in the air about what schools they're looking to apply to, um, how are schools going to evaluate their SAT scores, how to create that college list. If you feel like that is your student or for students in the room, if you're still kind of up in the air about that, on October 9th, we are going to hold a Applying to College 101. Uh, we usually do this in the spring of a student's junior year as they head into their senior year of high school. But if that is something that you guys are looking to attend, we're going to hold that one more time, uh, October 9th from 6 to 7. 30. Again, that it would be something you need to RSVP for. Just give us a call. We'd be happy to have you come to Concord. As for tonight, these are the agenda, uh, this is the agenda that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to define what financial aid is. We're going to look at how schools are evaluating that information, how to award financial aid, what is the differences between free money and your loans. We'll talk about that. 
We'll take a look at a couple different award packages and, and, realize, and take a look at how that works. We're gonna talk about how to manage the cost. Uh, we'll briefly touch on that. It's gonna become more real in the springtime when you've received financial aid packages, but we'll talk about it a little bit. And then finally, we'll touch on scholarships. What can seniors be doing now to be prepared to apply for those? Um, I do encourage questions. Um, this is, I don't wanna just lecture you guys for 45 minutes, that can be kind of boring. As you think of something, please raise your hand. I'd be happy to answer it. You might spark a discussion that somebody else might have been thinking about. So um, no question is a bad question, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. The Department of Education puts out this really, really long philosophy that uh, we've kind of summed up the best we could. Um, so understanding what financial aid is, the primary goal of this whole process is for financial aid to assist families in paying for college. As much as I would love to come in here and tell you guys that every college that your child gets accepted to is gonna give you all the money in the world for them to go there, it's probably not going to happen. Um, it does depend on what your FAFSA information looks like. Um, so although they are saying that the, the family is primarily responsible for paying for college, financial aid is there to assist you. Um, how they're going to do that is by awarding you two different types of financial aid. We define them as gift aid or self-help aid. The gift aid is what you guys want to see a lot of. This is your free money. Um, it's gonna come in two different forms. First would be your merit scholarships. Uh, these are often awarded through the admissions process. A lot of the times when students meet with colleges, they meet with their admissions reps, they're gonna tell them that they are a need blind school. What that means is that they're not looking at your FAFSA information. If they require the CSS profile, they're not looking at that to award merit scholarship money if they are need blind. So often that is based off of their academic record, their SAT scores, their college essay, there's letter of recommendation. So the bulk of their Common App is what's gonna be awarded to those merit scholarships. Um, a little bit of money, not a lot, goes through athletic scholarship money if that is your student, but most of it's gonna be merit based. The other type of free money, this is need-based grants. Um, so this is either gonna come from the federal government or the institution themselves. So they're gonna take a look at what your financial need is, and that's not gonna be the same from school to school because every school costs something different. So you might receive need-based money from one school and not the other. Um, it does depend on the schools that they're applying to, but it's in a form of free money that they're gonna give your student to help them uh, pay for that college. On the opposite end, you have your self-help aid, or what we call money in the moment. These are gonna be your students' federal loans and federal work study. It does not matter if you are eligible for need-based money or if you need all the need-based money in the world. Every student will be eligible for a federal loan, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The federal work study, this is a question that you would answer on the FAFSA application, indicating whether or not your student is interested in work study. It would give them the opportunity to work while they're on campus part-time and earn some money that goes right into their pocket. Um, we'll take a look at how that's evaluated later on, but first we have to figure out how to apply. Every school does require the FAFSA, so the free application for federal student aid. That became available, becomes available October 1st of every year. Um, so you guys as uh, seniors are all eligible to start filling that out. If we have any juniors in here, it'll be October 1st of your senior year. You can't fill it out early. Um, so every school does require that. The CSS profile, um, that is the schools that you see on that list that you guys grabbed, those are the only schools in the country that require that additional financial aid document. The biggest difference between the two, FAFSA is a federal document, the CSS profile is an institutional financial aid form. Uh, That's why only those schools are going to require it. Um, FAFSA is also free to apply to where CSS is not. There is a fee associated with that. Before we can even fill out the FAFSA application, uh, students and at least one parent need to create what's called an FSA ID. This is simply a username and a password in order for us to log into the FAFSA application. The primary ID that you will always use is going to be your students. Um, we harp on this a lot because oftentimes parents will complete this form on behalf of their child. Um, a lot of the appointments that we do, students typically aren't there. And we wanna make sure that we are as transparent as possible. It is the student's FAFSA application. So if you are completing this on behalf of your student, you wanna make sure you're logging in using their FSA ID. 
Um, it is derived from their a valid email address, a verified phone number, their social security number, challenge questions, all that kind of stuff. When they're deciding on which email to use, we would suggest do not have them use their school email. Uh, super important. When they have to go through this verification process with their ID, that email needs to be valid the entire time they're going through college. If they're using their school email, which nine times out of 10 will get turned off when they graduate from Bedford High School, they no longer have access to that. Um, and if they forget what their password is, they need to reset it. If they don't have access to it, you have to go to the Department of Ed. Super annoying, it takes forever. Um, so just make sure you're using a personal email. For parents, if it's a two-parent household, only one parent needs an FSA ID. Both do not need one. If it's a divorced household, the parent that is going on the FAFSA application should be the one with the FSA ID. The only time a parent is going to use this username and password is within the application to link your taxes and to sign it at the very end. You will never use your parent ID to log on to the FAFSA application. You will always use your students. Um, this is something that you would need to set up ahead of time before you can apply for financial aid. It is a different website. You're gonna go to fsaid.ed.gov. Um, this is where you're gonna go to do that. On page four of your booklets does also give you some information on how to set that up. Uh, but this will need to be done ahead of time. This right here, this is just a screenshot of what the FAFSA website looks like. We do like to put this in here because they tend to change their website every single year. So if, this, if you go on to apply for FAFSA and the website does not look like this, you are on the wrong website. Uh, make sure you're going to FAFSA.gov, not .com or .org. Um, it's going to make sure you want to look like this. If you are working on this from home and you get stuck or have questions, you're not really sure what to put on the form and what to keep off, you can obviously call us. We're a really good resource uh, for you to use at your disposal. The FAFSA kind of hotline, if you will, is this 1-800 number, so 1-800-4-FED-AID. They are also a resource if you would like to call them with questions. Um, so either one of us, I would say we're probably much easier to get a hold of, um, so, and we're local. So what is the goal of this process? Why do you have to do this? Um, when you click that submit button on the FAFSA application, what you're going to get is what's called an EFC, an expected family contribution. This is going to be a dollar amount based off of the information you provided on that form that the Department of Ed feels that you can contribute to your child's first year of school. You will disagree with this number. I will tell you that now. No one ever likes the number, no one ever agrees with it, so don't be surprised if you have that big eyed, I can't do that. That's okay. It's not necessarily what you are going to pay. However, it is a starting point for the financial aid office to determine what, how much financial aid your student can receive. What is important to know is that your EFC doesn't change from school to school, just the cost of attendance does. So you might be eligible for need-based money at one school, but not the other. It does depend on how much they cost and what your demonstrated need is. And when we take a look at different award packages that we've received, that might become a little bit more clear. You do have to file financial aid every year that your child goes through school, so that EFC could change from year to year. Um, you're always gonna be updating tax information each year that you fill it out. <laughs> Excuse me. So going into the tax information, um, that is the bulk of why you're filling this out. This is the information that the schools need to award financial aid. For seniors in the room, the tax year that you guys are gonna be reporting on your FAFSA form is 2018. It's the tax year they're gonna be working off of. You're gonna start school in the fall of 2020. We're gonna call this prior prior. You will always use two years back of tax information to report on the FAFSA application. How do we get that information on there? Not manually, we uh, transfer it directly from the IRS using what's called a data retrieval tool. Um, it's an online form that is linked within the application that will uh, redirect us to the IRS website and transfer your tax information onto the FAFSA form. The reason why we wanna do this is for verification purposes. When you apply for financial aid, the colleges have to select a certain percentage of their students for what they call verification. 
It's a random selection of students that they will get in contact with you and they will ask you to provide supporting documents to make sure the information you provided was accurate. The likelihood of you getting selected for verification does decrease if you use the data retrieval tool. They can see that we did not manually enter this information. We didn't type in a number wrong, we didn't put a decimal point where it shouldn't have been, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So they can see it's been transferred directly from the IRS. There was no case of human error. There are instances when you will not be able to use the data retrieval tool. If you file your taxes married but separately, won't be able to use it. And if you've changed your marital status after that tax year, you will also not be able to use it as well. Any other case you would be able to, we would highly suggest it. This will be the first time a parent uses their FSA ID is when you add the link to the IRS. They will ask you to plug in that username and password. Uh, so if you have the ability to use this, we would suggest it. Um, it makes the process of uh, completing the FAFSA a lot easier. Um, so if you were to come meet with us, it's always important to have your tax information in front of you because there is a chance where this does not work um, and you would have to enter it in manually. So um, just keep that in mind as you complete this form. All right. Any questions before we move on to the next section? No? Okay. So these are just some frequently asked questions that we get a lot in our office, so we do like to go over them with you guys. Uh, the first one, whose FAFSA is it? It's the student's FAFSA form. We harp on that a lot. We've already gotten calls that the FAFSA has been mistakenly submitted with the parent being the student. It's only three days in. Um, so we do, we, we do get that a lot in our office, so we wanna make sure that's super important. When is the deadline to complete FAFSA? Um, this is kind of a trick question. There is no specific deadline to complete this. Every school does have their own deadline. The two most popular would be February 1st and March 1st. However, if your student is applying early decision or early action through the application process, that financial aid deadline could be pushed up even sooner. So keeping track of deadlines is the most important thing when it comes to financial aid. A big misconception that we hear a lot is that financial aid is first come, first serve, and that is completely false. If I fill it out October 2nd versus a family that fills it out November 2nd, I'm not necessarily getting more money because I submitted it a month earlier. My FAFSA information is gonna dictate what type of financial aid that I get. Same thing for that next family. So as long as you're meeting that deadline, there is this pressure to get it done as soon as possible. We would encourage you to do it and not procrastinate and leave it to the last minute, but it's not first come, first serve. It will depend on the information you provide. Um, so that's gonna be important as well. In the back of your book, we've provided a table for your students to use, whether it's through here or some other uh, form of staying organized, but deadlines is the most important key. We've talked about which tax return you're gonna use. It's gonna be 2018. Um, who qualifies as an independent student? Um, these are gonna be yes or no questions on the FAFSA application. Uh, there's about eight or nine of them. Um, what this is trying to determine is if parent information is gonna be required on the FAFSA application. Simply looking at age, the student has to be over the age of 24 to be independent. The other circumstances would be if they were married, if they had any children of their own or any dependents that they supported financially, if they were active duty or a veteran of the military, in foster care after the age of 13, if they were emancipated, if they were ever in a legal guardianship, or if they were homeless. Um, these are all gonna be yes or no questions on your FAFSA application. If they can't say yes to any of those, then parent information will be required. If they say yes to even one of them, they will immediately be flagged as an independent student and parent information is not required on that form. Um, so it's pretty black and white, they're either answering yes or no. Which parents are included on the FAFSA application? If it's a two parent household, both parents are going on the form as parent one and parent two. If we are looking at a divorced household, what FAFSA is going to ask for is what they refer to as a custodial parent. Who does that student live with over 51% of their time within the past 12 months? If it is 50-50, which, no, which a lot of the time it is, they would then ask you to provide the parent that supported them financially the most over the past 12 months. Uh, those are really the key, the two key things that they're gonna be looking for to determine which parent goes on the form. 
if that custodial parent, whoever that may be, is remarried, their spouse is also required to go on the form. Whether they were married in the, in the tax year that you're reporting or not, FAFSA will, have, will be looking for you to report their information. So for the, for the FAFSA application, you can account for a total of two parents. The CSS profile will account for a total of four, if applicable. If biological parents are divorced and they are both remarried, both sets of parents will go on the CSS profile. They not only have a custodial portion to that, but they also have a non-custodial parent piece to that application. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, what if I have more than uh, one child in college at the same time? Is that gonna be the case for anyone? Awesome, I'm well, quite a number of you. So if that happens when they are in school at the same time, that will affect your EFC. So the number of students you have in school, that's how much your EFC is gonna be divided by. So if, if for one child you had an EFC of $10,000, you now have a second child in school, 5,000 would go to one, 5,000 would go to the other. So it makes them el each eligible for a little bit more financial aid as you have more children in school at the same time. Um, and then finally, what if I have a special circumstance? Uh, what this term is talking about is that um, if you feel that 2018, if you feel that that tax year, that income, your income brackets are not a good representation of where you currently stand financially, then you can request what's called a special circumstance. It's not a question that's gonna be on the FAFSA. There's nowhere that you can request that when you're filling out the form. It's a separate process you do after the fact. Because the FAFSA is a federal document, you have to report 2018. They're not gonna let you complete that without that information. However, once your uh, student has been accepted to college, it would be a phone call you'd have to make to the financial aid office and request a special circumstance form. Usually if you are requesting this, it is some sort of negative outcome or negative reason, right? You lost a job, you got laid off, unexpected medical bills, a death of a parent, um, would all be examples of a special circumstance. Um, what would not be a special circumstance is a call that we took last week, and this is not a joke. Uh, a mom called, and she said, I feel like I have a special circumstance, but I want to run it by you guys. We said, all right, what's your what do you think your special circumstance is? She said, well, my daughter's getting married next year, and I have to pay for her wedding. And we had to kindly tell her that that is not a special circumstance. Um, usually, again, it is a negative outcome, a negative reason on why you're contacting the financial aid office. With that being said, there is no formula to a special circumstance. There's no written rules about it. The college will tell you, the financial aid office, is that they're gonna use their professional judgment or their discretion on what to do with that special circumstance. The worst answer that you will get after submitting that is gonna be no. They are not gonna change anything or they could change something. Um, it's going to be completely up to them on the information that you provide them. Um, so a lot of the time is when you're going through an appeal process or if you do feel like you warrant that uh, special circumstance, it's a phone call you have to make. If your student's applying to eight different colleges, that's eight different phone calls that you have to make because each college assesses this information a little bit differently. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're working. If you feel like you do warrant that, you would want to call the financial aid office. All right. Any questions in, as far as this stuff here or anything that we've thought of so far? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, it's not gonna affect your financial aid, but you, would, you can still use your FSA ID for your, for your student. You don't need to create a new one, they just need their own. So parents can use an ID for multiple kids, it's just the students that do need their own ID. It's not going to affect their financial aid um, because nowhere on the FAFSA can you report that you have student loans of your own. Right, it's a great question. Anything else before we move on? Awesome. So when it comes into what is the FAFSA looking at as far as income and assets, these five things up here are what they are gonna be considering as income. A lot of it is gonna be transferred over using that data retrieval tool. If it's a two-parent household, what is not transferred over is a breakout of wages. What did parent one make and what did parent two make? So you would need to refer to your W-2s or a 1099 to get that information to input that onto the FAFSA application. Um, everything else up here, um, what is also not transferred over would be child support received for all children in the household 
but most of your income is going to be transferred with the I with that IRS transfer. Yeah. Correct. You, you still have to, they would still want you to report what you received for child support in 2018. If you, if there was a significant enough change in income, that's again where you'd want to call the financial aid office and have that conversation with them. But they would still be looking for you to report it. Yep, great question. Outside of your income, they're also going to be looking at a certain amount of your assets. Um, what you'll notice on this slide is that the two uh, big assets that a lot of people have that do not go on the FAFSA form are anything to do with retirement and anything to do with your primary home are two assets that should not be included on the FAFSA application. They would be included on the CSS profile, however on the FAFSA they are protected. Um, these are the, um, what they're going to be looking for. Um, the cash savings and checking, that's just liquid cash as of the day you're filling out the form. Non-retirement investments, um, equity in a secondary property, 529s are the big ones that we often see a lot as far as assets that need to be reported on the form. Yes. Yeah, you're 100% right. Um, if it's not in the parent's name that is on the form, you do not need to include it. So in a grandparent's name, a godparent, aunt or uncle, not included on the FAFSA, most likely included on the CSS profile. Yeah. Basically, anything that's not included on the FAFSA, you should expect to see on the CSS profile. Um, but yeah, that would be that for 529, that's a good point. Only if it's in the parent's name that's on the form um, for that uh, type of savings account. Right, so whoever is the primary account holder of that 529, that's what we would be asked, that's what we would be looking at. Yep. Um, for a non-custodial parent that has the 529 in their name would not go on the FAFSA form. So if it's a divorced household, only if it's in the custodial parent's name would that be going on the FAFSA application. Would go on CSS profile. Um, eventually, when you are in this finance section of the application, when we're working with your assets, you'll get to a question that's going to read, as of today, do your total assets exceed X amount of dollars? That dollar amount is predetermined based off of the age of the eldest parent in the household and whether or not they are married or, or single. So the example that we've given up here uh, for the current year that you guys will be applying for financial aid, for a parent that's 58 years old and, that they're, and they are married, then $9,400 of their assets will be protected. So that question would read, as of today, do your total assets exceed $9,400? This is a yes or no question. If you look, if you, when we go back to this information here, we have to think, okay, does a combination of these items on this screen, does it exceed $9,400 if you were 58 years old and married? If it's no, you simply just click no and you move on. They don't care because 9,400 is protected. If it's yes, you would click yes and it breaks it out into three different questions. The first one is gonna be as of the day you're filling it out, what are the balances of your checking and savings accounts as of the day you're filling it out? The second question is going to ask you about your non-retirement investments. So those would be the CDs, the stocks, bonds, mutual funds, money markets. 529s would fall into that category. Uh, equity and uh, secondary property would also fall into that category as well. Anything to do with any sort of retirement account, do not include it. Uh, that is completely 100% protected on the FAFSA application. The third question is going to ask about any um, uh, family owned businesses that are over 100 employees. Um, if you have a business that's under 100 employees, you don't need to report anything. Anything over that, they would ask you to report information on that business. Uh, so those would be the three questions that it breaks it out into. Yes? It would still get reported, yeah. So the question was if you have a 529 for a younger, for a younger sibling, the FAFSA would ask you to report the total amount for both 529 accounts. They would want you to report that. Yep. Yes. Yeah. 
Depends on, I mean, if the, if the, even if it's an owned, if you're a partner in a business that's under 100 employees, then, I don't, then you still wouldn't need to report it. If it's over 100 employees, then I'm not quite sure. Um, that would be something that you'd want to, that 1-800 number, I would suggest calling them um, because they'll probably have that answer. But if it's under 100 employees, you don't need to report anything about it. Yeah. Is that a hand? Yeah. If the, com if the money that you're earning from the business is reported on your taxes. Right, so that, that, information is, that information is gonna be there. Any assets about the business, that if it's under 100 employees, not reported. But any information that you had to report on your taxes, we can't go back and change that, it's already done. So they'll receive that, but anything else outside of that, um, what you had to report, not included. Yep. Anything else as far as what's reported, not what's not reported? No, anything to, do, anything to do with expenses does not get reported on the FAFSA form. So that's usually why no one agrees with that EFC, because it's typically, they don't, they're not looking at your mortgage payments, they're not looking at car payments, anything like that. CSS Profile, I believe, does have information about where you can report your expenses, um, because they're asking for a lot more information. A lot of the schools that you see on that uh, sheet of paper, um, academically, uh, very challenging to get into for admission. Not a lot of them are known for giving a ton of merit scholarship money. What they are known for is giving a ton of need-based money. So they would look at what your expenses are. They were, they're gonna look at your retirement. They're gonna look at everything. Um, so that's the biggest difference, but expenses not included on the FAFSA application. It's a good question. Yeah. For the equity in a secondary property. So if you have like, if, if multiple people, like let's say for example, you own a house with your three siblings, right? Then you would take 25% of whatever that equity is and that would be your share. That's what you'd be reporting. Yeah, you wouldn't have to report the whole thing, just your portion of what, of what you own if you're splitting it between other people. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so. Um, this, is, uh, this example is also um, in your booklet as well. Um, the only part that's not is this last section down here. Um, so working into the CSS profile, um, if you, how many people see schools on that list that your student plans on applying to? Nice. So you're not quite out of the hook, uh, out, of the, um, out of the gate yet. Um, this is an additional, so it's an institutional form. Um, so only those schools on that list require it. It's a little bit longer than the FAFSA application. FAFSA is about 100 questions. The CSS profile is pushing about 300 questions. Um, again, a lot more information goes on to that form. I know your child's making your life a little bit more difficult. Um, but that for, in order for a student to receive institutional uh, financial aid, they will need both the FAFSA and the CSS profile. They won't award it without both of them. Um, they're both, whatever their financial aid deadline is, that is when FAFSA and CSS profile are due. It doesn't mean you have to do them on the same day. You're probably gonna drive yourself crazy if you do that, but they're both due by that deadline. Um, CSSprofile.org is the direct website you can go to to fill this out. Unlike the FAFSA application where a parent needs their own FSA ID, you do not need your own to do this. Um, it's gonna be through your student's college board uh, username and password. So you would need to get that information from them in order to fill out the CSS profile. There's also, is that a question? Yeah. If, both, if the schools that they're requiring it, then yeah, they, they each need their own CSS profile application. Same thing for FAFSA, yep. Um, it's also not free to apply through CSS. It's $25 for the first school they send it to, $16 for every additional school. So on top of their application fees, so for this academic year, they're averaging about $40 per school. There's also an, a fee through here. However, if a student qualified for an SAT fee waiver, they would also qualify for a fee waiver through the CSS profile. Um, so that will be important for them to know as well. 
Um, usually we, like to, we do like to see a balance of uh, schools that students are applying to. We would recommend six to eight schools. Um, if we see that seven out of the students' eight schools are CSS profile schools, we might take a deeper look into what they're looking to study, where they're looking to go to school. Let's say they get into all eight, seven out of those eight schools are receiving everything about you financially. So there was no case. A lot of those financial aid packages could look very similar. Um, so just keep that in mind as they're developing that college list. We do like to see a balance of CSS schools and non-CSS schools. Um, more, more of the non-CSS schools do tend to offer more merit money as opposed to CSS uh, profile schools that are more need-based. Um, so how to put together the award package, we're going to circle back to those need-based grants. Uh, through the Department of Education, there is a federal Pell Grant program that, are, that is out there for uh, students that their EFC is below a certain threshold. Uh, for this academic year, it was $5,576. If their EFC was less than that, they would receive a federal Pell Grant. Uh, that is free money that the Department of Ed is going to give them to help them go to school. Uh, the lowest an EFC can be is zero, um, and the, that would be a full Pell, which is about $6,100. The closer that uh, EFC gets to that 5,500 mark, the smaller their Pell Grant is going to be. Um, so it's kind of a fixed number working off of that expected family contribution. For, uh, for first-year students that are going into college that do receive a Pell Grant, for our state university system, so UNH, Keene, and Plymouth, um, they have a program in place called the Granite Guarantee, uh, which means that they will be covering the cost of tuition for that student using their Pell Grant uh, money and institutional uh, financial aid uh, to cover that cost of tuition. Room and board they will not cover, uh, but the cost of tuition they will. The second uh, grant that you see up there, the FSEOG, um, this kind of goes hand in hand with the Pell Grant. It's kind of a two for one deal. If you're not Pell eligible, you will never see the second one. Um, so in most schools will offer you both if you um, qualify for the Pell Grant, but if you don't, you'll never see either of them. So that process is also pretty black and white. As far as your uh, self-help aid goes, so those federal loans and the work study, this is some information here. In your booklet, we've also provided you with the uh, full dollar amounts that every student is eligible for each year that they go through school. For a first year student, they're gonna be eligible for a total of $5,500 in a federal loan. Um, this is not required for the student to take, it is optional. Um, however, for most students that are looking to borrow money to help them go to school, this is the only loan right now that they can have without a cosigner. This one does not require them to have a cosigner to take this loan. Um, it is typically at a lower interest rate than some private lenders. Uh, currently, for this academic year for first year students, it's 4.5%. Um, it did decrease last year. We were at 5.02, so we did see a drop. Um, it does get reevaluated every July 1st. So for your students that are starting school next fall, they will have a different interest rate set for their federal loan come July 1st. Um, at that point, you can make that decision of whether or not you want to accept that loan. Um, in order for them to be eligible for this federal loan, FAFSA does need to be submitted. They cannot have this without that form um, being with the institution. You have really three choices with this uh, federal loan. The first one is that they can accept the full 5,500. How that's gonna be broken out is that typically they will receive a subsidized loan for 3,500, which is gonna be interest free while they are in school. The remaining $2,000 is gonna be unsubsidized, and that will accrue interest as soon as they start classes. Um, there is a six month grace period on that loan, so no payment is required while they are in school. The second option is that you just deny the 5,500. You don't need it, you don't want it, you, don't, you have other ways to pay for that 5,500, you don't have to take it, you can deny the full thing. The third option would be that you accept a portion of it. Typically, if you're going to deny anything, you're going to deny that unsubsidized portion of $2,000 because that's the portion that is accruing interest while they are in school. Um, so you do have those options. That is typically a decision that they're going to make in the springtime or once they've already chosen a school to go to by May 1. Um, 
you will see that on every single financial aid package of every school they're accepted to. The federal loan will be on every single one of them. The biggest difference of what you could see is that that subsidized piece, the interest-free while they're in school, that is need-based. So some schools might offer that to your student. Some schools will offer you the entire 5,500 unsubsidized. It does depend on the financial need that you're showing at that school. Um, so they can't deny you that money. They can, they, it's controlled on how they give that to you. Um, the federal work study. This is a question on your FAFSA. You can answer yes or no on whether you want to be considered for work study. We would default to yes on that question because it's never a bad thing. If you see work study on a financial aid package, this is not money that is coming off of your tuition bill. This is earned money that the student needs to um, take advantage of while they're on campus. They can hold a part-time job. They'd be paid bi-weekly, just like any job that they might have now. Um, and that's uh, money that goes right into their pocket. It doesn't necessarily go towards their loan. They can use it for that. They're not, you're not penalized early for paying uh, on that loan. They can use it towards books for the following semester. But in all reality, if they want to use that to go buy pizza every weekend, they could do that. It's their money to do whatever they want with. Um, but most importantly, it is not money that comes off your tuition bill. When schools evaluate the total financial aid that was offered to you and they gave your student work study, they will count that money in total aid offered. When you go to review how much it's gonna cost you to go there, you have to imagine that that's not even there. Because if you're anticipating that your student works on campus and earns that money, and they get there and they don't find that job, that money's not gonna just be given to them. It's just gonna stay in financial aid. Um, they have to work and earn that money while they're there. So um, that's gonna be, as you start to review award packages, if you see that, just put it off to the side. Imagine if it's not there. Is that a question in the back? Yeah. It's, so what you're gonna be billed on, that's a great question. So what you're billed on is what they refer to as your billable expenses. This is tuition, fees, and room and board. So it's all kind of clumped into the total cost of attendance. So it's not necessarily just going towards tuition or just to room and board. It's going off of that total cost to attend there. Yeah. Any other questions on either of these two things? We're gonna take a look at a couple different financial aid packages um, after this slide, but how they're gonna use your EFC is that they're gonna take your total cost of attendance and they're gonna subtract your EFC. What that gives them is your demonstrated financial need. And again, your EFC is not changing from school to school, just the cost of attendance does. So your eligibility for aid will change from school to school. Typically at public or state schools, because they cost less, there's less eligibility for aid at those schools. Where at a private school, because they cost more, there might be a little bit more eligibility there. So we're gonna take a look at a couple different award packages that we've received over the past couple of years. This is an example of one. Um, the total cost of attendance for this school was $55,000 a year with an EFC of 15,000. So they're gonna subtract that right off the bat. What this student is gonna be eligible for for financial aid is $40,000. The first thing that they're offered is that presidential scholarship for $10,000. That is probably coming from the admissions office based off of their grades and their SAT scores. Once that has been deducted, this school still feels that they have a significant enough gap where they're gonna give them another 7,500 in a university grant. So usually this would be like a Colby Sawyer grant or a Riviere grant. It's usually the school's name. The 5,500 you'll also see on there broken out the standard way. 3,500 subsidized, $2,000 is unsubsidized. That will be on every financial aid package. The student also received $2,500 in work study. So they were eligible for 40 and they were awarded 25,500. So what they were gapped was $14,500. And typically that's where students tend to stop and they'd be like, all right, this is how much I need to pay. But we have to circle back to a couple of different things. We have to remember that that EFC was taken right off the top. That is not money that the school gave you. That is what they're already assuming that you can contribute. So we have to factor that back in. And we also have to factor back in the work study because that's not money that's coming off of the bill. So when you look at your gap and adding those two things back in, what's due to this school for freshman year is gonna be $32,000. Uh, that is what the student needs to come up with out of pocket in order for them to attend that college. 
you will see that we put a total family share of 37.5, and that's because that $5,500 loan is still sitting there. They took that, if they're taking that loan, this student is now borrowing from two different buckets of money. Your federal Stafford loan, it's federal money, that's one bucket. That $32,000 is an out-of-pocket finance that they have either, you're paying that through your own money or through a, pri or through a private lender. So they're borrowing from two different places. So when they, in the whole grand scheme of things, but what they would have borrowed total for freshman year would have been that 37,500 for their first year. How you're going to be billed is by semester. Um, so when you receive that bill, usually it comes over the course of June and July, more towards the end of June, early July. Bills are typically due August 1st or August 15th. It does depend on the school. Generally, those are the two most popular dates with classes starting the end of August. Um, they will bill you in the fall. They will bill you again in usually January before the second semester starts. Um, it's safe to assume that when you receive that fall bill, you can multiply that by two. That's going to be your yearly cost. That's what you'd go to, your, that's what you'd go to a lender for. Um, so again, different financial aid package, same student, same information. The only thing that has changed is the cost of attendance, which changes their eligibility for aid. So what's important is that this student didn't change academically, they didn't change financially, but their eligibility of aid dropped because the cost of attendance is less. The scholarship amounts dropped because typically at a public school, the dollar amounts aren't crazy high when it comes to merit scholarships. The federal loan is still gonna be on there for 5,500. Their work study dropped a little bit. So when you look at what they were eligible for um, minus what they were offered and you factor back in both of the EFC and the work study, for this school what they, have, what they would have to come up with is $22,000. So same student, different cost to go to a different school. So a lot of the time in the spring, this is where we are meeting with students. Once you've received financial aid, that is a different appointment that you can come see us with. We'll have you bring in your award packages and we'll sit down with you. We'll discuss what did school A, B, and C offer you? What does all that information mean? How much is it gonna cost you to go there and how are we gonna pay for that? Um, usually those conversations are happening over the course of February through mid-April. Um, usually over the course of February and March is when you should be expecting financial aid back from these schools. Um, once they've been accepted. Admissions decisions will always come first, financial aid will come second. Um, and usually it's after January 1. I can, yep. This one right here? You have a question on this? Okay. You guys can feel free to take pictures of this stuff too. It's all online as well, yeah. Merit scholarship money, yes. For schools that are need blind, um, when, they're de when they're figuring out how much merit scholarship money to give that student, they're simply looking at their college application, so GPA and SAT scores. Once they've made that decision, then w that acceptance will then be notified with financial aid, and from there they can award need-based money as they see fit. Um, but the FAFSA does not dictate what, what scholarship they're getting unless that school is need sensitive. Um, there's need blind, meaning they don't look at financial aid. Need sensitive means they would take that into consideration. Most schools are gonna be need blind. Yeah. Any other questions in regards to these examples of financial aid packages? Need blind means that when a student applies to college, the, what they're reviewing solely is their college application. Um, that's how they'll determine scholarship amounts. Once admissions has made their decision, they will then notify financial aid that this is now an accepted student. They can review FAFSA, they can review CSS if they required it, and then from there they'll award the need-based money. the expected family contribution. It changes based off of tax information. So if you're, if, you, if you're pretty consistent as far as your tax years moving forward, then I would suspect that your EFC would probably stay relatively the same. How it would fluctuate is changes in income and changes in assets that need to be reported. Right, so then your EFC would essentially be divided in half. So for this particular example, if for one student it was 15,000, now that second child is entering college and you haven't changed financially, 
let's say it's exactly the same, then 7,500 would go to one student, 7,500 would go to the other. So then financial aid, the financial aid package would definitely change because now they're showing more of a need than they did with this example. So the more students you have in college, that would change financial aid. Depends on the school. Uh, some schools are one and done. Some schools will have you do it every single year. Yep. It's a question you'd want to ask their financial aid office. Yeah. Was there another hand over here? Yeah, in the back. Yep. They're just looking at assets as of the day you're filling out the form. So they won't go back two years on that as well. They're going to look at it as of the day you're filling it out. Yeah. Good question. Anything else before we move on? No? Okay. So now looking into how to manage that cost. So we finally, we get this tuition bill. How are we going to come up with uh, the money to pay for that? Um, in the current income and savings and tuition payment plans, these kind of go hand in hand. Um, every school, um, whichever school that your student decides to attend, uh, their financial aid office, their student accounts office will have an option to enroll into a tuition payment plan. If you are anticipating or thinking about paying any money out of pocket to help pay for that tuition bill, then instead of cutting a check just for a lump sum and saying, here, take my money, you'd rather pay that over the course of eight to 12 months, then you would enroll into a payment plan. We would suggest the most popular plan at the college level is 10 months because that's about the length of the academic year. Um, so for a student that is billed, let's say 20,000, and you are looking to contribute $5,000, instead of just cutting a check for five grand, you don't wanna be out that money quickly, you can enroll into a payment plan. Let's say you choose 10 months. That's a $500 a month payment paid directly to the school. Um, the biggest benefit of that is that they are interest-free payments, so we're not working with any of that, um, and you're working directly with the college. Um, you can allocate any amount of money into a payment plan. It's not required, but they will have it as an option. Uh, the more you put into a payment plan, the less it is that you have to finance from a private lender. Um, so it is definitely an option. If you are thinking of going that route, what I would suggest is have that, once they've made their decision come May 1st, I would work with the college soon after that to set up that payment plan because ideally you'd want that set up before you receive your tuition bill. That way the amount that you've uh, allocated into a payment plan is taken off of your tuition bill. So um, you don't want to wait until you receive that bill in the event because then they'll have to reissue you a new one. So um, I would have that set up ahead of time. Outside of payment plans, you have really two options. You have a federal parent plus loan. So the plus stands for parent loan for undergraduate students. This would be a loan that a parent takes in their name to pay for their child's tuition bill. A uh, couple things that are important about this one. The interest rate that you see up there, 7.08%. Just like the federal staffer loan, that also gets reevaluated every July 1st. So the PLUS loan will have a different interest rate for you guys come uh, this coming summer. For the life of the loan, it will always stay in the parent's name until it is paid off. It can never be transferred to the student's name. For a parent that has an 810 credit score versus a parent that has a 710, they're both going to get the same interest rate. It's a federal loan. They've set it for everyone. There is no sliding scale when it comes to the interest rates on the PLUS loan. Um, standard repayment lengths are 10 years on this loan. You can push it to a maximum of, I believe, 25 or 30 years. Um, they will also not cap you at a certain amount that you can borrow. A private lender would cap you. A Fed, the PLUS loan, does not. Um, but most importantly, for the life of that loan, it will stay in the parent's name until it is paid off. Um, it will start accruing interest upon disbursement, so there is no portion of it that's interest-free, portion that's not. The entire thing is going to accrue the interest. On the opposite end, you have a private student loan, which is a loan that your student would take out with a creditworthy cosigner. Um, they would need someone to cosign on that loan with them, unlike their federal loan. The two most popular lenders in New Hampshire are Citizens Bank and Invest in You, which is through our uh, loan program through uh, the NEF Network organization. So um, we would suggest to shop around privately first 
because we are, you're already gonna know what the interest rate is set at before you have to decide which avenue you're gonna take. What we don't know is what interest rate Invest in you is gonna give you. We don't know what citizen's gonna give you until you apply. So um, that credit score of that cosigner does come into more of a play. Um, each lender has different requirements, but at the end of the day, the school itself is not gonna tell you which way they prefer. As long as your student's bill is paid and it's paid on time, that's all they care about. Um, so you can do a combination of any one of these that are up on the screen. Um, you can do only one of them freshman year, a different one sophomore year, so you're not locked into whatever you choose for their first year of college. But between payment plans, parent loans, and private student loans are the three uh, primary ways that students and families are paying for college. Um, any questions as in regards to the parent loan or private student loans as of right now? We talk about a lot of this in the springtime, like I said, once you've received financial aid, we'll dive a little bit deeper on um, avenues that you can take, strategies that you can take to pay that tuition bill. All right. The last thing we'll talk about tonight is scholarships. Um, what can students be preparing to do? What can they be doing now um, to apply for outside scholarships? Um, on the national level, we have the College Board and FastWeb.com as two examples. Um, College Board last year in, um, came up with these new different, uh, these new scholarship opportunities. The direct website you can go to is opportunity.collegeboard.org. Um, it's a website that they can go to to uh, do different tasks that they already have to do anyway through this, ad through this admissions and financial aid process. And as they complete those tasks, they will be eligible for scholarship money. Um, some of those, um, steps that they would need to take would include creating a college list. Easy enough, they're already doing that anyway. That's a scholarship opportunity. Um, if they are practicing for the SAT through Khan Academy, that would be another scholarship opportunity. If they've uh, taken the SAT, when they take the SAT twice, if they do and they improve their score, that's another scholarship opportunity. They're consistently updating their college list. They're adding and subtracting schools, um, taking schools off and stuff like that. That's another scholarship. They apply for financial aid through FAFSA. It's another scholarship. And then finally, if they apply to college is their final scholarship opportunity. Six different steps of all things that they have to do anyway. The dollar amounts of those range anywhere between 500 and uh, $2,000, I believe. If they complete all six steps, their name would then be entered into a final scholarship drawing of $40,000. Uh, but they have to complete all six steps before their name is entered into that one. Fastweb.com, very similar. They would also be creating an online profile. A little bit more information goes into that. Um, they'll provide, obviously, who they are, what they're looking to study, where they're looking to go to school, um, GPA, SAT scores, that kind of stuff. And that will pre-populate hundreds of different scholarships that they can apply for. Um, again, these are on the national level, um, much more competitive to receive scholarships from, but it never hurts to put your name into those. Where we would tell you to focus on is your local scholarship uh, search. Question, yes. It depends on the school. Um, there are a handful of schools out there that do agree to meet a certain percentage of financial need. Uh, BC, for example, Colby College um, are two schools that agree to meet 100% of financial need. So for a student that gets accepted there and they bring in an outside scholarship, they might deduct, they might reduce that based off of the amount of the scholarship. There's only a handful of schools out there that do meet 100% need, um, so it's not likely that that happens. Um, most schools will just take that scholarship and deduct it from your tuition bill, but for schools that do meet 100% need, then that very well could happen. Um, so not every school, it does depend on the institution. It's a great question. Um, outside of the national level, New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, by and large, our biggest organization in New Hampshire uh, for students to apply for scholarships. There isn't much they can do right now. Their application isn't available until February 1st, and it's not due until April 17th. 
Um, so this is the springtime of your students' senior years, and oftentimes this is the last thing that they want to do. They don't want to fill another application, and they don't want to write another essay. Um, we would encourage them to do it. It's only one application that can be sent to a number of different people. Um, for New Hampshire Charitable, among a lot of your local scholarships, a FAFSA does need to be on file. So a lot of times we kind of get those questions of, is it even worth filing financial aid? I'm not going to be eligible for anything. Um, for local scholarships, a lot of the time they will look at that expected family contribution. So if your student does plan on applying for outside scholarships, we would encourage you again to file FAFSA. Um, outside of New Hampshire Charitable, um, Dollars for Scholars is another good one. Um, and then right here through your school district, I'm going to let uh, Lisa talk a little bit about that, about what your students can be doing right here through Bedford. So, Lisa. Thank you. So, yes, yeah, so a lot of the local scholarships like New Hampshire Charitable, if you go right to the NEEF website, it's a great resource for your student and for you, and you can get links to all of these right there. So that's a really great opportunity. They have a great website with lots of information. So I do encourage you to be familiar with their website and have your student be familiar with their website. Um, as you know, we use Naviance here, um, and we use that for scholarships as well. Um, again, a lot of our local scholarships will not be available until January and February. Um, again, once your students are kind of done that application process, they're starting to find out where they're going, they're kind of done, they're start that senioritis is starting to check in um, with them, that's when those applications are gonna start rolling in. Um, we, as counselors, we break up all the senior advisories and each counselor goes into an advisory and explains the process and walks the students through that. We'll also post it on our website. Um, we're currently looking at um, how we handle our local scholarships and trying to make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to show you exactly what we're doing just yet because um, we are kind of taking a look and seeing if we can make that a little bit better. Anything that comes through nationally that's, that's happening now that we get word of, we put right into Naviance. They can do a college search um, and, sorry, a scholarship search right in Naviance. And they can click on there too once they have gone in and done a search that the next time they go in, it's only going to show them new added added scholarships. So that's in there. Again, we'll be visiting, we're going to be visiting senior advisories soon to go over the application process, answer any questions they have about their applications. We're also going to show them where that Naviance search is um, for them in that system. And we'll be going back again once we revamp sort of the local scholarships. They'll all come through here. We'll have them all um, available to all the students and be making announcements for that. So um, I just want to take a minute to thank Cameron for coming out tonight. And he's got one more thing. Sorry, one more thing. Sorry, one more thing. Um, so the, la so the last scholarship that we have through our office um, is through our marquee event that we run every year. It's called Destination College. Um, this event is primarily for, um, or solely really, for high school juniors. However, our keynote speaker of the event will be a high school senior. Um, the speech itself is three to five minutes. Um, the seniors have just completed, the, the event is on March 28th. So at this time, at that time period, Students at, in their senior year probably have already been accepted to schools. They very well could have already made their decision on where they want to go. What advice would that senior give this group of juniors that are now about to start this process? Um, talking about what they experienced through the application process. How did financial aid um, impact uh, where they chose to go to school? It's simply just giving advice to this group of juniors that's in attendance. Uh, for this, uh, for March 28th, we'll be at St. A's. Uh, normally, uh, in the past, we've been at Plymouth or Southern New Hampshire, so really excited about being on a new campus this year. Um, for the senior that's selected, we have them come to St. A's at about 8, 8.30 in the morning. Uh, they'd give their speech in front of about 1,200 people. Um, so if that's something that you think your student might be interested in, um, if they are selected, we'll cut them a check for $1,000, and we'll send that off to the school that they end up going to. Um, so really cool event. We keep them there for the day. Um, so we have them sit on a student panel, and they're a part of the event. So if that's something that for students in the room, you could feel that you could uh, handle that and be comfortable doing that, and if um, parents, if you feel like your student is a, a good fit for that, then we'll start those applications, I want to say, in January, and they're going to be due February 14th. 
Um, so keep that in mind. Destinationcollege.org is where you can go to see last year's event, what it's all about. Um, great event. It's the biggest one that we do every single year. So um, keep that in mind for your students. Again, here's our contact info. If you feel like you'd want to come see us and have help through this process, that's what our goal is. Our goal is to make this as easy as possible for you. We understand that it is stressful. It's probably still overwhelming. Anyone still feel stressed and overwhelmed? Did anyone feel like they learned something that they didn't know before they came in here? Awesome. So, you know, I, I promised I'd do that. I'm glad you guys learned something. Again, contact us, email us. We'd be happy to help you. Um, kind of the follow-up to this, um, it's also available online, is a presentation called Paying for College 101. That deals solely with once you've received financial aid packages, how we can interpret those and how to think about strategies of how to pay for that. So, um, I was, is it March 3rd? March 3rd, we'll be, back, um, we'll be back at Bedford to do that presentation. So that would be the follow-up to tonight. So thank you guys again for coming. If you do have remaining questions, I'd be happy to answer them individually. Um, but hope you guys had a good time and have a great night. Thank you.